Hello, everyone. My name is Serena, and I'm very pleased to welcome everyone to this session, both in the audience here in Glasgow and to our digital audience who's tuning in for this session. Um, if you want to ask any questions during this session, for the audience here in Glasgow, you're welcome to raise your hand when we come to this part, but you can also send in questions online via Slido, and for that we have a code which will show up at some point during the session. Um, other than that, um, it is my great pleasure to introduce this panel on young women and climate justice, the fight for our rights. Please welcome to the stage Alison Castillo, Karen Watson, Marinel Ubaldo, Marie Cristina Colo, and Serena Jemet. Hey, hi everyone. Can you hear me well? Okay, yeah. so. <laughs> Welcome to our panel. I'm Alison Castillo. I'm from Chile. I'm youth delegate of Amnesty International here at COP26. That's why I'm here. Uh, and I'm also part of the Global Youth Collective. So today also will be the share of this amazing panel that we have. Um, I'm, so I'm very happy to share this space with so amazing activists today. Um, it's really important to hear their stories, to hear what they have to say, especially because um, today we're at COP26. Um, the events related to climate change and gender are taking place. So also because it is important to to fight for gender justice, because if not, we cannot have um, climate justice. And in this world we are already in, that is already affected by the climate crisis, women are the most affected um, by this issue. So, yep, um, I don't want to say anything more for now, so I would just now give the space to these incredible women so they can introduce themselves. Um, Marinel, do you want to start? Hello, everybody. Um, this is my third time in the ferry. <laughs> but um, I'm Marina Lobaldo. I come from the Philippines. I'm a climate justice advocate, also a survivor of Super Typhoon Haiyan. But um, most of all, climate and gender um, justice advocate. Okay, thank you. Karin? Uh, hey, everyone, and thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Karin Watson Ferrer. I'm from Santiago de Chile, but currently living in Barcelona. I'm a human rights activist. I've been working with Amnesty for seven years, I think. And currently, I'm working especially in the intersection between climate and gender with my own organization called Latinas for Climate. Serena? Hi, I'm Serena. Um, I'm a second year politics and international relations student at the University of Manchester. I've been working with Amnesty UK since I was 14, um, so it's almost five years. And um, I recently, well, not recently, about three years ago, was elected onto the Children's Human Rights Network, and I'm now kind of doing the climate stuff on that network. Um, within my work with Amnesty, I have led with the Student Activism Network, um, the climate campaign and I was on a podcast for gender and climate um, for the students for sustainability which is like a part of the NUS which is all kind of UK organizations um, yeah uh, hi everyone my name is Mary Christina Kulu I'm from Madagascar uh, I'm wearing several hats but let's summarize them um, I'm an eco-activist, uh, eco-feminist, eco sorry, a climate activist and a social entrepreneur in Madagascar. I'm currently leading the national platform on gender and climate justice. And, um, and yes, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much and thanks again for being here and for sharing some of your activism today with us. So to continue, we prepared some questions for you. So about your... Um, your work that you are doing and how, how challenging it is to be a young women climate activist. So each of you will have two minutes, I mean, yeah, like around two minutes to respond to each question. So the first one is to Marina and Serena. And is, do you think the intersection of being a young woman has an impact on your climate activism? 
Right, I'll kick it off. Um, I say absolutely. It 100% has an impact. And you can look at that in kind of two ways. You've got the first aspect of being a young person and then also being a woman. And they're both kind of like, ultimately, you can be patronised in both sense. Um, so in terms of youth, especially when it becomes to under 18s, you have safeguarding practices. And I think a lot of organisations kind of see that as a barrier or it is a barrier in terms of youth engagement and youth youth involvement because it's like a few extra forms so a lot of organizations just kind of get a bit lazy and they're like that's a lot of effort to do um, and that means that it can quite often be quite disengaging for young people and they're not taken seriously and they're just not involved end of um, like a key example that I always kind of use is with former UK Prime Minister Theresa May saying um, with one of the first climate strikes in the UK saying I'll just go back to school in a few years, come and be a scientist and figure it out then. And thousands and thousands of children and young people mobilised for these strikes and they were just completely disregarded purely because they were 16 rather than 19. And that reason uh, is just absolutely not, the, like it should not be the case whatsoever because their opinion is just as valid as some, that of an adult. And also, I mean, with the internet and social media, children and young people are far more knowledgeable nowadays. They have so much more access to information that, again, it's not really the case that they're not educated as much so. And then in terms of women, like, women are disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. In the UK, I would say it's more so based on discrimination based on sex and gender rather than physically, for example, obviously, women in refugee camps, the violence against women is a lot higher, but like in the UK we don't really feel the consequences of the climate crisis as much so so it's more to do with the kind of discrimination based on that sense and again like it's just being patronized purely for being a woman and having those kind of opinions so I'd say like it comes in terms of both you can look at it in terms of both aspects of being young and being a woman and if your activism isn't intersectional you're just continuing to protect the people who are already protected and the people who hold the power are going to continue to hold the power and uphold the status quo which isn't really serving us as we want it to be um it's just kind of like looking after themselves and not actually like letting them be accountable and your age doesn't necessarily like your age doesn't devalue your opinion or your the validity of your opinion it just offers an alternate perspective a young person might be seen as naive but they're just hopeful and positive and an adult might be seen as realistic but they've just kind of got fed up and drained with the world so they're quite pessimistic so I'd say like it doesn't it doesn't change your opinion it's just a different perspective and all perspectives are equally valid and we should be looking at the climate crisis through all of those lens thanks Marina. yeah in my experience um we always hear you know people say that you women, you youth, children, you don't know what you're saying. Or you women, you're just so emotional and loud. And that is always common um, when we do activism. Like you are just loud, you're women, you're just emotional. And people always say, people always thought that these are weaknesses. But in reality, these are actually strengths because this actually is what makes us more empathetic what makes us more compassionate we feel what we can empathize with other people and that is why we really have to push for our positions even decision making processes like in our community if you are women if you are a woman and if you are youth you they elders would always say oh um study more or like uh, you still have a ra so many food or rice as we call it in the philippines you have so many rice to eat um until you have the like opportunity to actually be here and talk to us. And that is disrespectful, actually, in the Philippines, a conservative country, that is disrespectful if you will tell them in front that you're actually wrong. We can actually be part of the nation building. We actually have solutions in the ground, and we actually can be part of the decision-making processes. That is disrespect, disrespectful in the Philippines, in a, in a conservative um, country like the Philippines. So um, for, uh, for so many youth, we want to be part of the decision-making processes. We want to be part of the nation building. We want to be where the decision-making is, where the decision is being made. But those kind of norms, those kind of um, societal hindrances, uh, societal issues actually hinder us from 
um, doing that, from being part of that. And that is why in climate justice, for, in advocating for climate justice, you didn't just advocate for, um, for the climate, you also advocate for justice for all, including women, gender, children, for them to be part of the decision-making processes. Because you, our leaders are just, you know, um, deciding what's better for us, not even consulting us uh, on those decisions that they are doing. And we in the communities will be bearing the brunt, will be bearing the effects of what they will decide in those closed doors meeting. So that is really important why we, I mean, if you see all those leaders in the plenary, in Blue Zone, how many are women? Are there any, are there even like women who are like youth or youth there? Like, how many of them? One, two, three? And the rest are all white male? I came from, just before I came here, I came from a high-level luncheon meeting with, uh, I don't even know, I can't even remember. They're so full of white male. <laughs> and that is how we actually, and these leaders are there telling us that they're actually listening to us. They're actually saying that, oh, Alok Sharma actually sit in a panel with the indigenous people, taking pictures and posting it on Instagram or in social media. But are they considered, are the, we considered in decision-making processes? These people who are in high-level um, lunch, and I, I actually had lunch there and I left, but it's, it was okay, the food was okay. <laughs> but aside from that, you know, you cannot really like, that was too technical and they're just boosting their innovations, quote unquote, that actually just benefit them and not the community. Fossil fuel leaders were there and they were in front, all of them, white males. And there were just two African women who were sitting at the front. There is, there we can see how misrepresented we are in even this kind of gatherings. And however they say that we are, this COP, it's, COP26 is inclusive, this is not inclusive and we need more representation. A lot of people came here. Um, I don't want to say that they wasted their resources because we came here, we wanted to be part of the, negoti of the negotiation, of the discussion, but there is no opportunity. So even if you're here in Glasgow attending COP26, if you're just observing and COP hopping going around pavilion and you don't actually um, engage in discussions, how, how can you share your story? And all of us here have our own story to tell and we can be part of that discussion and decision-making processes. Thank you so much, Marinelle. Um, Serena too. So now our second question is from is for Karin and also for Marie. So it's how do you balance your work on gender and climate? Do they intersect in your activism or how do you connect them? Who wants to start you? Or okay, okay. Karin. I'm gonna start. <laughs> uh, well, as I was saying before, uh, I define myself as a human rights activist, but I've been working on human rights, especially on sexual and reproductive rights for years. And working in this topic, I started to realize how important uh, like recognizing the climate change as a climate crisis was in the topic of human rights. Right now, we recognize uh, the climate crisis as probably the biggest threat to human rights in this century. So. That's how I started to become like involved in development. Uh, I am not one of these like maybe ecologists or environmentalists like caring about the polar bears maybe. I mean, I of course care about them, they're super cute. But <laughs> uh, that wasn't like how I became involved with the movement. Uh, but when I started realizing how it was affecting people's lives and people's rights, it's when I realized that I had to work on that. Actually, for example, meeting Marinella a couple of years ago, learning about her history and the history of her people, um, you can actually see how this is affecting directly the rights of the people. So 
I was, I was trying to work in this when I also realized the impact that it has on gender. We know that uh, climate change, cl the climate crisis, is affecting especially the most uh, vulnerable and marginalized communities in the world uh, already, and especially women and girls. Um, so how do you work on that? Uh, from my point of view, as I'm a Latina woman uh, from Chile, uh, I started working with some friends in a campaign uh, for a regional treaty uh, that is called the Escazú Agreement. Uh, it was a regional treaty of Latin America and the Caribbean, and it was the first legal mechanism that recognized the right to a healthy environment, but for me, at least most importantly, it was the part of this, this agreement that uh, spoke about the protection of land defenders. Because, you know, uh, Latin America is probably the most dangerous place in the world to be a land or water defender. The people who are fighting now for their land, for their, their homes, they get attacked, they get threatened, and they get killed. And actually, in the last year, I think, I don't remember the exact number, but I think it was three out of five murders happened in Latin America. So we started working because we thought it was really important to actually, for our countries to sign and ratify this agreement. Um, <laughs> I don't know if this sounds a little insane, but Chile was one of the countries that actually imposed this agreement. And when they had to sign it, they, uh, they didn't want to. Now we know why, because the president had an interest, like a, an economic interest in one part that this agreement could, um, uh, like, you know, they could have problems uh, to sell like a minor project and all, like for his family. I mean, it was like a super corrupt situation. It was really sad. But anyways, um, working in this campaign, I started working with people uh, from Latin America, and we realized that all of us who were working in the campaign, we were women. So we realized that we wanted to keep working together, and we wanted to keep that gender um, component in our work. So we co-founded the organization Latinas for Climate. Uh, we were nine girls between 17 and 23 years old, I think, uh, working for that, and we started working uh, to democratize the information. It was during the pandemic, so we couldn't actually go to the streets, but we thought it was really important to make uh, information accessible for women and girls, because also we are from Latin America. We mostly speak Spanish or Portuguese, so all the information on climate change and a lot of it on gender, it's in English. And a lot of people in our countries can actually speak English. It's a big privilege for me actually being, being here is speaking in English. So our first step was actually making uh, the information accessible. And then we started working with a lot of, uh, of girls actually from our countries to empower them uh, through education uh, and also to inform and to to bring more people to this concept of climate justice, but also climate justice with a gender perspective, with a gender lens, as the mask says, <laughs> or feminist climate justice. Because we think one of the most important solutions to climate change is feminist climate justice. <laughs> Hey, no, it's my time to share my story. I, I, I don't want you to be afraid of me. I'm not an extremist or something <laughs> like that. Um, so, um, my background is a bit different. I started by being a climate activist, an environmental activist when I was eight years old, fighting a Chinese, fa oops, a, a factory, uh, uh, arriving in my, uh, in my town and start polluting. But yeah, uh, becoming a climate activist, it arrived um, later when um, I had the opportunity to work in the deep south of Madagascar that is currently facing, uh, if you have seen the news, the, the first worldwide uh, famine um, directly related to climate change. We have more than one million persons suffering today from the famine, mostly women. Um, and yeah, six years ago, I, I had the opportunity to work there as a UN volunteer. Um, 
and even if it was my own country, I, I was, it, it was very, okay, I, I'm trying to find the words, sorry for my broken English. Um, uh, but I, I was very moved by, you know, you, you, I, I was seeing people uh, losing all their dignity, uh, asking for food, begging on the street, climate refugees everywhere. I, I, that time I also saw uh, even one woman trying to, to, to sell our, our cooking stuff in exchange for water. Uh, and I realized that we were not talking about climate change that time in my country. We are a young country too. 70% of our population you know, is under 35, but we were not sensitized about w climate change. So that time I, I started uh, the, the first youth movement in my country. It was just before COP21. Um, and we, we reunited um, youth from uh, Madagascar and other Western Indian Ocean Island. Um, we, uh, maybe some of you have heard about COI, the Conference of Youth. The Conference of Youth are this conference happening just before COP. Usually these conferences um, take place in the same place as COP, but uh, just before COP21 for the first time, there was uh, this initiative of holding regional conference of youth. So uh, people from the Global South could contribute more to, to um, to this, do, to this exchange, discussion, capacity building, ad, and global advocacy. So I was the coordinator of the of this first regional uh, COI that time, and I was able to create this platform that is now advocating in the Indian Ocean Island in order to valorize youth initiative, youth, youth solutions. But uh, even if you know, I had a lot of recognition with my work as a climate activist, I, I just like you, I met many <laughs> high level people and um, I, uh, I felt incomplete because um, actually like many women in the global south, um, I'm bearing the, um, how do you say it in English? I'm bearing this, um, you know, this heritage of patriarchy and capitalism, it's only I'm this this violence against women, this gender based violence is everywhere. And I'm myself a, a rape survivor. So and I'm not ashamed to, sh to share that. But actually, why I'm not ashamed is because I had the chance to to meet at uh, two years ago. Uh, I'm, I, I, I met the women and gender constituency at COP, uh, COP25, and um, and just like you know what you shared, Marina, they thanks to them I realized that it was okay to be emotional, it was okay to be sensitive, and it, it's it w I'm an activist, but I'm not a superhero. I, I'm a human too. Uh, I'm a woman also, and and yes, I I should. Um, I should use my position to, to, you know, to 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 protect and fight for for gender equality, and and when you and, and also discover what what was ecofeminism, ecofeminism, this strong link between you know this patriarchy and capitalism. They are both the origin of. Um, they are both the the causes of the destruction of our planet, but also violence against women today. So if I wanted to change something, I had to fight against patriarchy and capitalism. And I can't do this separately. I can't just fight climate change without considering this violence on women. And I don't do this only for, for all the, the survivors like me. I do this also for me. Uh, this is... Um, this is my way of uh, healing myself too. Uh, it may be selfish, <laughs> but yeah, I, that's what I do. And and for me, being an eco being an eco feminist today, it's my way of being complete. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the four of you. Of you.
Uh, so now we have um, a final question for this first round of the event. This is for all of you. Uh, so the third question is, um, is in what specific ways are women's and human rights particularly affected by climate crisis in your region? So who wants to start? Serena? <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm from the UK, and I would say that it kind of affects in two aspects. M number one, the fact that the impacts of from climate change are more subtle and they're kind of longer term in the UK. We don't we don't really see like tsunamis here exactly, and that so it's more long term and subtle. And then the second aspect is that I think that the the effects of climate change are almost actively hidden from us in terms of through youth washing, in terms of through greenwashing, and in terms of individual blaming individuals rather than corporate responsibility. So for example, BP actually created the term carbon footprint in 2004, purely to blame individuals and kind of take away their corporate and social responsibility. 70% of emissions come from 100 companies. Like That statistic in itself is enough to prove that it's not an individual's fault you driving to work instead of taking a 40 minute walk has nothing to do with the fact that our planet is about to die. Like our house is on fire. It has absolutely nothing to do with the individual. Cor corporations need to take that responsibility. And even, even in charities and kind of like the Western media, Western media often blames individuals because it's easier. They're owned by these corporations. And they also blame marginalized groups already. So they might blame women for having too many children. It's just, it's not the case. Like, stop shifting the blame when you just don't have the courage to take responsibility and kind of amend your actions. Even in charities, you've got like sexism, fat phobia, racism, violence, they're all very prevalent. And that's within charities which are kind of trying to solve these issues. In climate charities, especially, it's very heavily kind of white middle class activism. And it's just very white. You've got, you've got to look at the power dynamic within that charity and organization. And it's often kind of the CEOs and the top positions are white men or white women. But again, it's very white. And we need to kind of pass the mic and listen to the voices of those who are most affected in the global south. Um, and like in terms of organizations, they very often greenwash. So their sponsors might be BP, Shell, massive like massive polluters you know coca-cola the fourth largest polluter no the largest polluter for the fourth year in a row um nestle massive human rights abusers and they're kind of here a lot of them are sponsoring cop and they're here at cop pretending like they care about our planet but they just are trying to find their kind of new ceo to front their new kind of climate campaign and they're looking to maintain their profit margins but do they care about the planet no so there's a massive, massive thing on greenwashing, and the same goes for youth washing. Quite often they'll look at kind of saying, oh, young leaders 18 to 30, we're missing out a huge bracket of under 18s. And again, it comes back to the safeguarding aspect because they're too lazy to do an extra sheet of paperwork to actually provide an accessible space for under 18s. And I mean, these spaces are often quite intimidating for young women. And so they need to be welcoming, they need to be accessible, and organizers should be thinking that from the get-go. Organizers should want different perspectives and different opinions, and they should make sure that these spaces are accessible from the absolute get-go. And to do that and to maintain kind of, I, I've done a lot of work on meaningful and genuine youth engagement, and to maintain young people through activism is to make sure that their opinions are appreciated, are respected, are validated, and valued as a whole. So like in terms of climate and ju gender justice, obviously they come hand in hand, but also we need to appreciate the fact that one solution isn't gonna tick all the boxes. Carbon capture isn't gonna solve the gender pay gap. So we have to kind of spotlight different, different issues at different points. But again, it comes down to the accessibility thing. So for me, I'd say, it it's just massively, in terms of how human rights are specifically affected, is you've just got to look at the rights holders themselves. If you're looking at how climate and gender go hand in hand, you need to be hearing firsthand from the women. And it's not that there aren't people who have the opinion and have the expertise to say this. 
there are those people you just actually need to look and be like, okay, I'm going to hear from the rights holder themselves. I'm going to pass the mic. It's not my decision. I don't need to. I don't need to say what they're saying. I can just amplify their voice from underneath. I don't need to be the forefront. I can just pass the mic. Yeah. Well, um, there are so many um, inequalities already, right, in the communities. Even without an emergency, there are already inequalities in terms of gender, and people. Well, women usually don't have the same access and the same opportunity as men, and if you see the, those kind of um, of uh, those kind of imbalance, those kind of injustices, they are being um, exacerbated. They are being they are amplified when there is a disaster. So, for example, in our community, when Super Typhoon Haiyan happened, rape rape cases increased, and people were evacuated in the same area without even a toilet for to separate both and boys and women there is no room for people for women who are bre breastfeeding and after super typhoon haiyan i i have my, so many peers like women who who were forced to drop out from school because it was the men who were prioritized to continue studying while well, these young women were sent to big cities to work as sales ladies and maids so they can support their families back home it is always the man who has the access the opportunity to those um to even mental services mental health services to clinics to to education and to other rights that we actually all have and women don't have that kind of access we don't have the kind of access to information because people say the society says that um, we're women we should be we should stay in our houses we should our job is to procreate but that is actually not true we can be part of nation building we can be part more than procreation and we have the right to choose if we want to procreate or not if we want to have children or not or if we want to marry or not we all have that kind of choice and that is not our job here in the planet to just give you, give our husbands future husbands children because that is not what is our job we can be part of the decision making processes and um, there is already inequalities, even a job. Women who already have children, even like those teenage um, victims of teenage pregnancies, they were they are not given scholarship. They are not given um, the the opportunity to have job or to work because they already have children. And people think that it actually lessens their capacity to be part of the workforce, which is not. And they can be, I have seen a lot of, of, of um, young people who already have children. They're actually already successful. They're teachers, they're now um, really good at their own workplaces. And that actually shows that we can be whoever we want to be, even if we are victims of rapes, if we are victims of typhoons, even if we come from a very marginalized communities. Wherever we come from, Wherever, whatever our socioeconomic status is, we can be part of the solution. We can be part of the nation building. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I just want to uh, compliment a little what you say. Uh, actually, what I have here, it's about like UN reports and global witness reports. And they explain how the climate crisis ex is exacerbating uh, natural disasters. And this uh, exacerbates also the inequalities um, already ingrained in societies. So for example, uh, women and girls are often the last to eat or to be rescued. They face greater uh, health and safety risk when water and sanitation systems are compromised. And they assume a greater uh, burden of domestic care uh, and care work. Uh, also, as you say, uh, they are more exposed to also the uh, sexual violence component that probably men don't have in this situation of crisis. Um, also, in many developing countries, women and girls are often responsible for carrying water and collect 
fuel and food supplies. So that's one of the main points. We already know those, stati those statistics. We know also that 80% of, of the climate refugees now are women. So we know that that like big gender component uh, and it's also like exacerbated in the global south, of course. And more specifically in our context in Latin America, uh, as I was talking before, um, it's probably the most dangerous place in the world to defend the land and the territories. Uh, we face, <laughs> or territories or people are facing so many different companies that come to our lands and they basically steal because nobody is uh, stopping them. You know, they steal our resources. In Chile, for example, we are living a severe drug, but also we know it is not only the drug, but it's the companies that are uh, stealing the water of the people in order to, I mean, for their farms and all. Uh, there's a big, actually, like a big, big, problem and situation there with the avocado farming uh, in Chile. We know that there are so many people, so many women that don't have access to water because uh, these avocado companies are stealing the water of the people. And then when they try to face uh, these companies, these people that are stealing their resources and their rights, they get killed because they have to power the do to do it. And because our governments are not <laughs> doing anything, they're not doing enough in order to protect uh, the people who are fighting for their rights. Um, also, uh, like to add to that, uh, as I was saying, like women are the most uh, affected by the climate crisis for all the things I already said, but also because Mo like in general, they're the ones that are leading these fights in the communities. They're the ones that are facing these companies. So they are the ones that are getting attacked, that are getting threatened, and they're, that they're getting killed. Um, and also, especially, this is worse for girls and women that are part of indigenous communities. Uh, and just to end, like, numbers that I have here, of the 212 murders documented last year, I mean in, two t in 2020, sorry, uh, 40 were indigenous people, although they represent only 5% of the world's population. So you can see how every component, I mean every part of your identity uh, because of intersectionality is affecting even more the people. And I also wanted to refer what Serena said because for us in the Global South, for us in Latin America, it's ridiculous to be honest. Uh, when we hear all these people like, or governments also telling us that you should take uh, shorter uh, showers because you can tackle the climate crisis like that. When you know that they are literally letting companies steal the water of the people. So <laughs> I think it's very important to also highlight the importance of um, tackling the, I mean, fighting the, the climate crisis as a systemic fight. We can't uh, like keep uh, blaming people for the individual actions if we know that 71% of the emissions right now are produced by 100 companies. So I think we have to, I mean, of course, individual action is important and it's good. It's also <laughs> like always good to make some changes, but we can't blame people. We have to fight for systemic action, for systemic change. <laughs> Um, so, uh, actually you said almost everything <laughs> should I had. Maybe discuss a little bit more about my context. Um, so Madagascar is among the most affected vulnerable countries regarding to climate change uh, consequences. Uh, but usually when you ask people, have you heard about what, uh, about what is happening in Madagascar? Some of them will say, oh, is it a real country? It's not a movie, it's not a cartoon. So that's the kind of reaction that I have. Um, also, um, yeah, we used to be like this invisible country uh, with invisible voices where um, you have all these local communities affected by uh, the consequence of our climate change, whereas um, 
we didn't contribute to this. Uh, actually, we, we are not guilty of all this uh, gas emission, but we are the victims today. Um, how do you explain that to some women who have to uh, do kilometers, sometimes 20 kilometers to collect water, um, and then they come back home exhausted, uh, they have no time to rest because in our patriarchal society, um, they are the one in charge of the food, of education. They, 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 uh, they are the one in charge of collecting energy too, um, or finding energy. And yeah, the, uh, the, the, the men, just imagine uh, the, the current drought that we are facing right now. Amnesty International just released two weeks ago uh, a report on uh, how climate change is currently affecting uh, the, the south of Madagascar and affecting the, the human rights in Madagascar. So feel free to, to look at it. I won't share the, the, the content of the report, the full content, because it's like that. Um, uh, but I can share you some examples of uh, what uh, I faced in the South because I'm working with local communities, I'm working with women's organizations in the South, uh, and I know how they are facing drought. Uh, just imagine you're a woman, you have your period, but there is no water. What do you do? Uh, because we are in a society where um, Having your period is still a taboo. It's it's dirty for a woman to have her period, so you won't have access to water. You will use dirty water, or sometimes yeah, I saw some of them using sands instead of uh, instead of water. They use sands. They use seawater. They use whatever they they have. So this has a consequences on uh, this has a consequence on. Uh, the right to hygiene, the right to health for this woman. Also, another another thing that I uh, that really moved me, and this happened a few years ago already. There, there was already the, the, the drop that time. One of my neighbor, um, she was pregnant. She was about to have a daughter, and uh, and her her husband left because. Um, because they couldn't grow anymore on their land. There was no water, so he became a climate refugee. And she was there with nothing. She didn't have access to education because she was married when she was only 13. It's normal. We live in a patriarchal society uh, where women are objects. Uh, so, yeah, she was married very early. She didn't go to school. And when a man came to her, older men asking her that to buy her baby in, in, in exchange of food, she said yes. So actually, when I exchanged with some local authorities a few weeks before COP26 about this situation on, on girls' marriage, uh, increasing of girls' marriage because of, uh, of this impact of climate change, they were telling me that, oh, but this is not selling daughters. It's, it's just an exchange. It's, it's nice. It's, it's convenient for, for the family. So, and yes, of course, there, there were men talking. Um, so now I, I hope that thanks to this talk today, you, you'll understand that how, how much these gender inequalities and climate change are so related, are so connected. Because we are not only talking about statistics, we are talking about uh, stories about people suffering today. There is an emergency today. I don't want uh, when when I'm at COP26 and I'm attending this negotiation and events. I'm like, why are they are still talking? <laughs> but <laughs> and they talk so much, like sometimes for nothing, and. Of course, you, you feel frustrated. You, you think about your, your community back home and how much they expect some strong decision. But yeah, we are still fighting. And I'm very proud and thankful to be with other inspiring women because fortunately, we are together in this.
thank you all and thank you for your inspiring answers because it's really important what you have been saying because uh, it's really important to talk to the people so thank you all to you for for listening us listen them and so yeah so before to continue please give them another round of applause <laughs> Okay, so now we will have some space for a Q&I. Uh, so if, feel free to raise your hand if you have any question. I know that we have also uh, people in Zoom. So if also like people um, seeing us online, if they have any questions, uh, we will be responding them now. Uh, so any of you have any questions for any panelists? Yeah. Uh, what advice would you have for young women to uh, get their voices heard more and to be acknowledged more and be more part of the conversation? Uh, just want to say that probably like um, it could last like one or two maximum because of the time. So who wants to go? Um, in terms of so I've done like a lot of stuff on kind of meaningful youth engagement and that kind of stuff. And I'd say it is very difficult to keep that motivation going. Like I've been involved since I was like 14 and to be honest, I'm quite surprised I'm still like a activist and a human rights defender because I think it is so easy to be patronized and kind of dismissed. And so mm, I'd say first thing is like you have to maintain that willpower and even though multiple times you're going to think, no one's listening to me, no one's taking me seriously, you just have to keep going. You just have to keep repeating yourself. You have to be like, no, I, I back myself that my opinion is valid. I absolutely back. I know what I'm talking about. I know this through and through. For me, I over-prepare just so that I can sort of have that self-motivation. And then if someone dismisses me, I'm like, actually, no, because I have prepared enough to know what I'm talking about. So I say, like, first, it's just making sure that you're comfortable with that so that you can maintain that perseverance to do it. And ultimately, like, there aren't that many people in these spaces. Like, there aren't actually that many youth activists. And as bad as it is, like, a lot of companies do youth wash, right? So they're just going to keep coming back to you. And if they dismiss you you can then start demanding more from them you can say no I want to be amplified even more so kind of thing so I say it comes like down to that ultimately like you just have to have that kind of perseverance to continue to kind of say what you want to say and build your network I'd say networking is such a huge thing as well like me and Karen first met two years ago on a panel about youth engagement <laughs> and we live in different, like, different continents even, and we're still in touch. So it's it's just stuff like you just, in your spaces, you can meet such incredible people. Like everyone on this panel is an absolutely incredible woman, and I'm most definitely going to be staying in touch. So it's just building that network to then also just amplify each other, like repost what they're saying, just maintaining that perseverance, and you never know when it's going to come in handy. So I say networking and just keep going, and it sounds really awful advice, but... I don't really know what to say because ultimately like it comes down to like the leaders of the organizations as to whether they listen or not. You can't force someone to listen to you, but you can continue going and eventually someone will. Do you want us to answer that? Um, in all my speaking engagement, I always say, because this always comes uh, like a question of what do you want to say to the youth? I always say never underestimate your power to make a change because you're just if you're thinking you're just one person making a difference you're not just you are not a quote-unquote just you are one person making a difference and we should never disregard that I never plan to be a climate activist I never plan to be here I never plan to be um, in stages I never plan to be um, anywhere. I just want to have a happy childhood. I just want to have a normal adolescenthood. I don't. I just want to have a teenager um, time that I could spend with my family. I could go to school. I could reach my dreams. But because of the climate crisis, it is actually stealing our childhood. It is actually stealing a lot of times that we could have spent it with our loved ones. 
But it is so important that you go back to why you're even here, to why you are even, to why you have even started this fight, to why you are even advocating for this. Because you always have to go back to your why. And when everything, like what's happening now in COP, when everything is so disappointing already, you just have to go back to why you have even started. Because that will like um, center you to pushing through because your future, your community back home is worth fighting for. And never ever say that you don't matter because you matter and you just have to follow what your passion is. Put your heart into something. If you are passionate about something, that doesn't have to be climate change in general. That could be in water, that could be in land, that could be in... Climate change is so broad, you can just even... Um, you can just focus in one theme and it doesn't need you don't need that grand action you don't need that 10,000 followers in IG we were doing our actions in community without even a follower we didn't even have a social media we were not posting it we don't even have a one like because for us that doesn't matter as long as we are impacting our communities but now during the pandemic we need to convey our message and that is through social media and what I'm saying is you didn't need to have that kind of, you know, um, big social media page or an Instagram. You just have to know where your heart is and fight for what you believe in. And you matter, whatever you are, whatever you do, you matter. Yeah. Can I say something? I just wanted to add, uh, also like, I started in activism when I was 12, I think, and I don't know how many times I heard that I was <laughs> too stubborn, too irrespectful to like adults, that I was, <laughs> that I was dumb, of course, that, um, I don't know, like so many like awful words about me. I, o I also was a lot of times called a communist because I care about human rights in my country that happens. Uh, but I think you just have to embrace that, <laughs> you know, like embrace all this. For example, I embrace, I am really stubborn, uh, but I'm proud of it. And I think it's really important to embrace how you are. And if you really believe in what you're doing and you really think you are doing the right thing, you have to embrace that and just keep going. That's my <laughs> advice. <laughs> Okay. I, I, I just want to add one <laughs> sentence. You know what? <laughs> On Instagram, uh, my name is Stubborn Girl, girl so <laughs> <laughs> I completely get you. Okay, <laughs> so any other questions? Do we have? Okay. We've got quite a few questions come in online from our audience watching there. So I wanted to pose one that I thought was quite interesting here. It's from uh, McKenna from Kenya who's asked, what first steps should local communities take to encourage and support women's grassroots organizations in the area of climate action? Who wants to go? Marie? You're all looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, uh, I, I don't know the context in Kenya, it's, it may be similar to Madagascar, but I can share what we, we are doing um, in order for, for the community to, to, um, uh, to, to valorize this gender, um, uh, gender solution, gen gender climate and gender initiative. Um, we, first of all, we have to also discuss with the men. Uh, this should be inclusive. Uh, um, I, I'm not, I, I don't say that I hate men. It's not like that, no. <laughs> uh, they, in, in the contrary, they should be part of the discussion. Um, and what we are doing uh, is, uh, in Madagascar, the first step is first to discuss with these traditional leaders, with elders, because we know that they have the influence, the power to change, you know, even if, uh, if uh, it's a part of our culture to treat women this or this way, if you are able to convince the, um, the elders or, or the traditional chief, this 
uh, for 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 me and for for my community. This is the first step. I don't know uh, about you. How do you deal with it in your in the in your different context? But for example, if we want to talk about sexual violence, uh, about sex, and this kind of um, sensitive uh, topics, uh, we we don't arrive in the community and and we we are not like teaching them and, and saying that, oh, what you're doing is a bad thing. No, we want them to really appropriate, to really understand. We want them to, to, to you know, to develop themselves, their own solutions. And we, it, it, it won't work if uh, you arrive in a community and you, you know that there are, there, there are many violence against, uh, the, there are many gender-based violence in this community, but, but you, you arriving like this and saying that this is bad, this won't work. So yeah, involving the community, uh, trying to create a bridge, a link with them, uh, building a trust, this is what we do. It takes time, <laughs> a lot of time, but uh, it worked in some of the communities and, and actually um, uh, because, of, um, because of the drop that we are, we are having now, um, you know, there are more and more men who, who are losing their confidence and they are, <laughs> they are asking women to be part of, uh, to, to also share solutions. So it's surprising that now, uh, I won't say thanks to climate change, but at least, you know, uh, they, they are trying to consider more women leadership today. And yeah, that's, that's the change that I'm seeing in on the <laughs> with the communities. Um, I can add to that. In the Philippines, um, first, uh, first of all, um, what we can actually do to be part of this movement is first register to vote uh, and vote. <laughs> because that is very basic, and that is basic human right to actually vote. And we need more ally in the environmental movement. We need more political, um, we need more politicians who have the wheel and the balls to actually, sorry to say that, sorry, just came out. <laughs> the, those actually have the will to uh, make change happen, to actually influence the system. Because um, if we will just shout in the streets, but they're not listening, they're just in closed doors meeting, nothing will happen. Our leaders have the power, the authority, and the resources to make systemic change happen. Because alongside with our individual efforts, we also have to make sure that there is a system change, that we lobby and we partner with the government. Because with the legislators, those who, made, who make laws, laws, and those who actually implement them in the ground. And for us in the communities, we can actually ask our um, barangay officials, we call it in the Philippines barangay officials, but maybe you call it traditional leaders. Yeah, we can ask our officials, what are, um, are your initiatives on this issue? Because you, they usually have that. And how um, we could join that initiatives in amplifying that in our own communities. So if you don't see any initiatives that you can actually join, you just have to ask uh, and um, try to be part of that. And there are actually so many opportunities. And the, the one of the problem is we don't have access to these opportunities in the ground. We don't know that there are actually opportunities in the ground. So it is so important to ask and to ask more. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we are running out of time, so maybe we can just take a last um, question and one of you can answer that one. Uh, okay. Hi. Uh, given your experience at COP26, what's one thing that you'll change about your activism going forward? Karin, uh, do you want to, or not? Oh, well, anyway. Okay, that's actually a super difficult question. Um, I'm not sure how to reply, to be honest, but I think what I realized during this COP 
um, it was about like how exclusionary it was because I mean I was uh, in Madrid uh, in 2019 and I think it was actually easier uh, to be part of the discussions and then the thing is getting worse <laughs> it seems so I don't think it's like about changing but I I felt that we really had to to like open up spaces you know for example for me uh, I'm from Latin America, but I'm still a white person. I'm very privileged. I mean, as I say, like just speaking in English is a privilege in Latin America. So I think it's very important that we recognize those privileges. And then when we see opportunities coming, because normally those opportunities come to the white people, to, to the ones who can speak in English, uh, we are as we realized that like during uh, COP with my organization and we realized that we had to do something. So we started searching for more Latin American women, more young women present at COP. And what we did is just pass the mic and just take these opportunities, but give them to the people. Because we saw like these spaces uh, weren't there, like they weren't open opportunities. There were super close and super few opportunities that we could take. So what we wanted to do w was actually to share those opportunities. So I think that's very important, like recognizing your privilege, recognize the position that you're in and trying to help others that also deserve to have like their stories shared. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> um. <laughs> so, um, well, our time is over, so uh, I wanted to thank you all for being here, for hearing us, uh, because, yeah, well, most of us are here because of COP26. Uh, we are good delegates, and we came with these hopes of, like, being part of the conversation, of uh, being part of decision-making spaces, and that has something that hasn't happened inside COP, so it has very difficult for us to be here, for being part of the... the but yeah, of these spaces, because we are here, we already have the privilege to have access um, to these spaces, but when you are inside, you also realize that there are people like more privileged than you that took these spaces, and it's still like this year, we have a lot of youth representation, we have a lot of people from the global south, uh, from indigenous communities, um, but instead of that, we are not being here, so. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for being here, uh, from the people that came here and also from those who are in the Zoom <laughs> or in the transmission. Um, so yeah, thank you. And yeah, also yeah, another round of applause for, for them. <laughs>